Thomas is going to be talking about um, different ways of handling phase two when nothing works. And he has so many resources for that. Maybe some of you that don't know me, I'm Patricia Rothstein. Um, I'm a CIT and a certified uh, EMDR clinician, and I'm a co-host in the EMDR learning community. So I'll hand it over to Thomas. Well, thank you. I mean, maybe I'll just give a kind of overview and then we can have a conversation wherever that kind of goes. So since the beginning of learning EMDR, I've been writing about it. So, you know, really within a month of um, finishing my part one training, I started writing about EMDR because it was it was amazing what I was seeing. And then as I kind of matured in EMDR, a lot of people seem to be, as I started providing um, consultation, a lot of people really seem to be struggling. And they were struggling at this disconnect between how we train and actually implementing that with really pervasively traumatized clients. And these are the clients that motivated you to get your EMDR training in the first place, right? Your healthiest people didn't. It's your people that with probably with the most severe trauma that did. So almost everything I've done has been at that intersection of, of translating um, a standard protocol, which is incredibly useful, incredibly helpful, um, particularly for your healthiest top half of clients. And standard resources are particularly helpful for, you know, your healthiest, you know, healthiest chunks of clients. But um I've spent a lot of time just reminding people of things that I think they already knew before they took their part one training. And part of, I think, what we knew is we knew how complex, complex trauma is. We know how, how in some ways, how carefully we have to approach clients' nervous systems when they're really, really pervasively traumatized. So... Um, I think a lot of people get their EMDR training, they get this impression that, that EMDR is this kind of magic wand. And that's that's not how, you know, it's not how Shapiro understood it. And it's not, I think, the intention of treating it, but it's the take-home message, right? I'm just going to, you get this this magic wand and we're just going to go boing, boing, you know, just, just uh, it's almost like Oprah giving away Hyundais, right? We're just going to, everybody's going to get, everybody's going to get healing. But that's not the AIP model. So everything that I'm, you know, I have, if you've worked with me, you may know that I have some opinions about things. And many of those opinions have to do with how we approach clients' nervous systems. But one of the things I think Shapiro would not have possibly got more right was the AIP model. The AIP model, I think, describes perfectly, perfectly clear what is happening in EMDR therapy, and it explains why, what's happening when things go well. And it really also explains what happens or why things aren't going well. Because rather than a magic wand, where we're just, you know, helping people resolve trauma, this is an information processing model. And the information that we're trying to process, the AIP model opens up communication, and lets us metabolize it into right now existing adaptive information. So what we're doing in EMDR therapy is we're connecting information to other information. And your healthiest clients have a Mount Everest size amount of adaptive information, right? Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of memories of, of nurture, support, validation, belonging, right? It's easy to believe the things of your earliest nostalgia really easy. It's in your bones. But yet they've had these slivers of trauma, right? So those slivers of trauma, those little bitty, I and mean, they can have a really big footprint on your life. I'm not minimizing, you know, single incident trauma. It can really disrupt your lifespan. But they have an enormous amount. Healthy people have an enormous amount of adaptive information for that difficult stuff to connect with and metabolize into. What do we know about clients with complex trauma? is that many of them have been in survival mode all of their lives. So when would they have had time, right? When would they have had the, um, the capacity, 
you know, to go out and bump against life and have experiences that are that would have helped them develop that adaptive information. So one of the key metaphors, and again, if you're if you're not a metaphorical person, I'm not your consultant because I, everything I do is is really, really metaphorical. So again, one way to think about the AIP model is think about a boat. And the boat is the amount of accessible adaptive information that you have right here, right now, today. And the fish is the memory we're trying to land. So if we're connecting old information into right now existing adaptive information, you have to have a boat big enough to support the fish you're trying to land. And you can't connect a trauma the size of Mount Everest to someone in a boat that's an eight foot canoe. It, it just it just doesn't work, right? So again, we're connecting information to other information and Shapiro is very clear. You have to have enough of the needed adaptive information. The beauty in the AIP model is this really bit of positivity is that everything, the information that you need to heal is already in you, except when it's not. And when it's not, there's nothing about the AIP model. There's nothing about the eight phase protocol that is going to get you a bigger boat just because you're connected to a bigger fish. You know, there's a lot we could talk about here, but part of what I'm communicating and, and the, 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 we'll put the link or make it accessible to the free training that I have about really thinking differently about phase two. The original title of these, you know, series of resources was What's So Complex About Complex Trauma? And I changed it to um, approaching phase two differently with clients with complex trauma because I want, so what's so, diff, what's so complicated about clients with complex trauma projects the problem completely onto them. And of all the things we have to change, all of the levers that we may be able to adjust, how we approach these clients is probably the most powerful level of all. So what I'm really talking about is how we approach clients with pervasively traumatized nervous systems. Because if we're approaching everyone with the same set of resources, right, with the same expectation about how their nervous system is, it sounds kind of like we're putting people through a machine. And it's not long before at this little toy metaphor where we train you this way, right? And then you'll have a client this shape. And the most common kind of, you know, the most common kind of thing people bring to consultation is tell them this EMDR thing isn't working. CMDR thing isn't working. And, and again, are we trying to put everyone into the same, right? Or, or are we looking at our client's nervous system? And are we making sure instead of like, you know, cramming everybody into a very specific shape and then saying, oh my gosh, this client must have protective parts, which they probably do. Oh my gosh, this client has a blocking belief, oh, which they probably do, right? Oh my goodness. But what is it that we can change? What is it that we can learn from our clients? Well, look at them, look at them, learn from them, get information about their nervous system. And then what we need to make sure we're doing is we're matching our, inter we're pulling our interventions and we're matching our interventions to the nervous system we're working with. So Yes, working with clients with complex trauma is always, always hard, but we need to be approaching EMDR differently. We need to be approaching mindfulness differently because you're working with a completely different wired nervous system. So how we approach our clients matters. Now, you can do everything in the training, you know, that I provided, I have five different resources and we'll kind of talk about what those resources are. Um, I could have 50, but when you look at those five, you'll see what the modifications are, right? There, every single one is guided by very specific principles. You can make whatever you do um, 
similar to one of those five that I've given in the training. So um, if we really understand the, the nervous system of the clients that we're working with, we wouldn't be going, okay, okay, well, okay, well, now we're in phase two. I'm going to teach you these resources, right, to a client, by the way, who when they first sat down, they told you mindfulness has never worked for me. And now we're going to teach them. We're going to be the 15th therapist that's going to teach them mindfulness in exactly the same way, except now, you know what we're going to do? We're going to do even more weird because we're going to have you do some slow tapping while we're having you do something that, that never works. So if you listen to your client, if you try to understand the, the nervous system and how they've survived, it's going to make sense that their survival strategies are going directly opposite what we're asking them to do. We're asking them to slow down. We're asking them to be present. And we're asking them to notice, right? Um, how many clients have you had whose survival strategy is to not slow down? How many clients have you had whose survival trust strategy is to not be present, right? The present, they'd rather live. I mean, their nervous system would rather live in the worst parts of the past and the biggest worries of the future than be right here, right now in the present. And noticing, noticing, I mean, I've had clients that would rather me set them on fire than have them, than have them um, slow down, be present, be present and notice. Anyway, questions. Thomas, what are some of the, the tools that you use for clients that, for example, say, um, I don't like breathing because it makes me nervous or, yeah. or when you ask them uh, to focus or not what they notice in the body, they don't notice anything. They right. have completely shut down. What are some of the... Right. So let's imagine, let's imagine a client. We're sitting, um, we're sitting in a small room. Um, to, you know, back, especially before COVID, we're sitting in a small room um, with someone with a pervasively traumatized nervous system, right? Someone who's looking at the shadows as they pass under the door. They hear people walking the hallway, they're looking at the shadows, right? I'm sitting in a small room with me, who's always identified as male. And what am I doing when I'm asking them to do some, some slow, deep breathing, right? Typically, in that slow breath, they know I'm asking them to relax. They know that I'm asking them to turn their radar outward to inward, to notice internal experience. And they also know that when we're done with this, I'm going to ask them what, what was your, they're basically, if it's anything like um, the past therapist that they tell me about, they go, how much did this, how much did this calm you? How much did this calm you? So they, they have this performance anxiety going in knowing that I'm going to inquire about their internal experience. And then we do this glacially slow exercise, right? And I, I a part of a lot, I think a lot of what I learned about mindfulness, learned from my own process. So let me give a little quick story. As a new therapist, before my own EMDR therapy as the client, I went to a motivational interviewing training and at the beginning of it, someone came in and they said, um, this is Sarah. She's going to walk us through a 20-minute mindfulness exercise. And I kid you not, I'm sitting there and I see her mouth and it looks to me, I mean, maybe this is a dissociative response. It looks to me like she's saying, we're going to do this mindfulness exercise it's going to last 200,000 years, <laughs> right? So, so I think a lot of what happens is slowing down and my survival strategy then was stay ahead of it, stay ahead of it, stay, you know, just go, 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 think, 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 right? Um, live in this part of the brain where I could be competent, where I could feign competence, where I didn't have it on, on deeper channels. So... Do you see the problem there? Slowing down went against my survival strategy. It was too spacious. It left too much. And some clients, for example, that uh, have been sexually abused, the perpetrator told them to relax. Right. 
or, or or send messages like that. So for some people, that that indication is can be extremely triggering. Exactly. So so why would some why would we why would we invite someone who said deep breathing has never worked for me? Why would we go on to teach it in a glacially slow? <laughs> painfully slow internalized way just because i don't know because we're us and we think it's gonna it's gonna go better so so back back to breathing how how you might do this differently so number one be very very brief very very brief and i mean don't just say you're going to be brief because that's a lot of, sometimes that's what people do when i kind of tell them about that they say okay we're going to do this really quickly and then they go on and they do these mindfulness exercises just a little bit shorter than they normally do no i mean really brief so what i'm looking for is i'm not looking for a breath to calm you i'm simply looking for a breath that doesn't make anything worse Okay, and we're going to calibrate that as success for today, just for right here today. It's not, it's not where we need to be, but you know this. You guys are experts in complex trauma. Before day one of your EMDR training, you knew more than almost anybody else on this planet about how to work with this population. You just bought the magic wand and you got confused, right? We sold you a version of ease. I mean, not hopefully not the training programs that... <laughs> that, I, that, that we train, but yes, this work, this phase two work is always going to be difficult. It's always going to be slow. And you knew this before you got EMDR trained. Okay. So, so number one, when we do, when we do any kind of exercise, number one, make it breathe. Before we do that, ask permission. It's 2024. Ask permission. Describe right? And you're describing to the client and to the client's parts what this exercise looks like. You're letting them know this exercise is going to be over in about 12 seconds. Okay. Um, do you see the lesson, the Tom lesson in 20 minutes, now 12 seconds, we can, we can tolerate something that may be difficult in 12 seconds. So the two versions of the breathing, number one, I call it blue smoke breathing, where if especially if you're a former smoker, this is easier to kind of do than it is. But we imagine your breath as a kind of blue smoke, the out breath. And when I invite it, I will often demonstrate a breath at about the rate I think the client may be able to tolerate. So I may go, you know, kind of something like this. Right. So that was about a two second in, three second out breath. Very, very quick. Okay. My eyes are open. I'm not telling them to close their eyes. I'm not anything. So I'm going to see if they can try to visualize that blue smoke, right? Their out breath as a kind of blue smoke. And what I like about it is that there's something about visualizations that tend to take offline our capacity to ruminate really hard. So if that, if they were able to see it and that was okay, okay, I'm going to invite two breaths at that pace. Okay, and I'm going to ask, was that okay? I'm not going to ask, what were you noticing? I'm not going to ask, did it calm you? I'm just going to ask, how was that? Was that okay? And if that was okay, we'll take three breaths and see if you can see that blue smoke in each of those three breaths, and then we're going to stop. Because I do not want, if your survival strategies have been to slow down, I don't want to slow you down too much because your parts are going to start rattling about that. Okay. If blue smoke doesn't work, and sometimes I'll start with this breath as well, I invite you to do this with me, okay? And I, I invite you, and again, I, again, I start with that consent. We're going to put your hand about six to eight inches from your mouth. I invite you to do this. We're going to take one breath on our hand, and I invite you to just notice on that out breath, and any breath that's tolerable for you, on that out breath, notice, is your breath warmer, cooler, or the same temperature as your hand? Good. Good. Excellent. And if that went okay, right, didn't make anything worse, I'm going to say good. On the next breath, can you notice where the air is hitting your hand? Is most of it hitting at a certain place? Or can you notice kind of how the air is distributed as it hits your hand? Good. 
Good. How did that go? Okay, good. And then the third breath, if that went okay, I'm going to ask how the air is moving around. Let's imagine the air is a kind of fluid, like almost like we're like, this is a, in the air is a fluid, right? But we're going to imagine it's a fluid. It's kind of like water. And we're going to, can you notice it moving between your fingers? Can you kind of visualize how it's bouncing off your hand? Okay, good. How did that go? Good. And I invite you because we're going to get to a lot of what's I think really, really helpful in this. So can can we kind of open the mic or open chat? What was different? What's different about teaching breath in this way? Because there's each of those things is going to be the active ingredient. Amy. I really love that it's not focused on the breath, really. You're focused on your hand. When I was a therapist in the probation apartment, we were taught, like, you don't say spread your legs. You don't say, you know, whatever, because that's what a perpetrator might have said. And it's more like put two feet between your, you know, two two feet between your legs or instead of putting your hands behind your back, like, you know, touch the uh, the side of your shirt or whatever. And I really like this because it's not, the the focus isn't on the breathing. Yes. And that's, I love that. Good. Sorry. And the I focus is the, yeah, the focus is external, right? The focus is on the external experience um, on your hand. And remember when I said clients are pretty hypervigilant that are monitoring constantly what's happening in the room, they can do this breathing and still know I haven't gotten out of my chair. They can do this breathing and know that nobody's coming at them. They can do this breathing with their eyes open because I'm asking them for visual cues in some of these breaths, right? So, um, so each of the resources, it, they, I call them dip your toe in resources. They are resources designed to be quick, right? Have you done, have you ever done sensory grounding with a client that was just way too slow? Or have you ever done, yeah, maybe sensory grounding and they're like, I only heard one thing. You said to notice three things I hear. I only heard one thing. What is it about me that everybody else can hear three things and I only hear one thing? So yeah, some people asked it, it noted that this was open. There's not a lot of agenda. And if we can find a breath that isn't triggering, we can put a toe there. And then next time we can put two toes there. And then we can put toes over here. So much of this is about, and kind of the newer conceptualizations of neurobiology, it's about helping people have an experience that is different, that we can subsequently link up stuff with. We're creating an instance of something. So if you have this, and again, maybe it's in the territory where people store blocking beliefs, right? I can't slow down. I can't do mindfulness. I can't whatever. Do you see even in this breath what we just did? You were just able to, to slow down briefly, right? Engage in something, and it didn't make anything worse. Whereas your schema before was all of this stuff makes it worse. It's a disconfirming experience. It's a disconfirming experience, and it's an instance of something, right? We Again, all this information we give them, it is the experience of it that makes the information actionable. It's the experience of something that metabolizes the, all this information that we've, that we've been giving them. So, yeah. Amber mentioned that, that uh, there's no instruction on how to breathe. There is no take a deep breath language where mm -hmm. clients start getting critical about how they are breathing. Exactly, exactly. And, and with these exercises, we just wanna find a breath that's tolerable. And you know what happens at least half the time after we've taken that one breath, two breath, three breaths, do you know what happens at least half the time? Clients are reporting a slight relaxation response. And when they report a slight relaxation response, what I'm saying is, good, notice that, but also notice that it's about to return back up to your baseline. Right, because our clients, one of the other kind of key metaphors is if you're working with a client with really, really severe trauma, 
the metaphor that I use, if it's like a car with a cinder block on the gas pedal, okay? So if you have a car going 95 miles an hour with a cinder block on the gas pedal, what happens when you tap the brake? What happens when you tap the brake is they may slow down a tiny bit and then you take the foot off the gas pedal and then it goes right back up, okay? We need to calibrate that that's what working for you means. That's what working for me means right here, right now. Because we approach mindfulness as the therapist as though you don't have a cinder block on your gas pedal. And if you don't have a cinder block on your gas pedal, we, we do these exercises and it calms you down a lot and it keeps you calm until something comes along and pushes your gas pedal, probably later on today. It's a completely different nervous system. Having a cinder block on your gas pedal is a completely different nervous system. So this little bitty tiny relaxation response is one of the most important things we're gonna do in this person's therapy because we've just showed them how to on purpose regulate a tiny bit in the present moment. And then we're gonna leverage that and always make it slower if we need to. We have another question or comment here from Kelly. What may be a good exercise or helpful to begin with if a client presents with many thoughts at once and very talkative without many pauses, more along the lines of stimulated ADHD and not due to substances. Hoping this makes sense. Yeah, I'm. Uh, to be honest, what I would do is probably explore. I probably wouldn't be doing any intervention right out of the bat until I explored. When do you slow down? Right? Do you have a dog? Do you have, is there anything that you do? Is there any activity that you do that does let, you know, let you slow down and be a little bit more present? And again, if I'm going to invite a client with this to slow down, with, with this presenting issue to slow down, it's only going to be for this long. Only going to be for this long. Because um, clients that are go, 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 that's probably a survival strategy. Okay. Why? Not to be present and not to notice. It's probably a survival strategy. And survival strategies are really, really, really strong. So we need to ask permission. We need to lower, not lower, but we need to recalibrate our expectations. Because even this... Let's imagine this. We tap the brake, you slow down a little bit. That's not enough, right? I mean, if you have a headache and I give you an aspirin and it helps for 15 seconds, you're going to tell me that that thing didn't work for me. So a lot of this is recalibrating expectations. That 10 seconds of that you got the second time we did breathing, that's what working for me means. And we're going to leverage that toward a better regulated nervous system. But you can't go. So many clients, imagine phase two is like this canyon. We just have them jump and they fall in, jump and they fall in, jump and they fall in. We need to construct accommodations for their nervous system. We need to build bridges, help them build bridges for their nervous system. We have yeah. another question from Amanda. And she says, um, the question for me is the ultimate progress goal and what that looks like as we move forward with a challenging client like this. For example, are we working to increase the time they are doing this? Mm -hmm. Are we building up to be able to tolerate creating a nurturing figure? Are we encouraging them to do this at home? If they don't do, we keep doing it in session until they do. So what's the yeah. goal? Yeah, so all of this, all of this. And, and you know what? Do you know what this must sound like? This must sound slow. Doesn't it sound slow? But do you know what? Before your first day of EMDR therapy training, you knew this was going to be slow. You knew working with a pervasively traumatized nervous system was not going to be just a handful of sessions. Treat, line up these targets, treat them, get them out the door. It's not. So... The goal first is to create an instance that we can then leverage. 
And yes, eventually these slowing down for half a second, or when I teach sensory grounding, we're checking each of the senses two seconds. The whole sensory grounding exercise is over in about 40 seconds. Okay, lightning fast. Absolutely, once the nervous system can identify this as an okay thing to do, and I'm gonna have the client do it. See, here's, here's another huge mistake and how we often typically teach mindful stuff. We teach a client, maybe a client that has panic issues. We teach a client a tentative breath and they go home and they do it only when they're having a panic attack. So what does that do? That pairs panic with the breathing exercise that we're doing. So if you only eat key lime pie when you're having a panic attack, how long before the smell of key lime pie is gonna give you a panic attack? So homework is do these exercises at your baseline. Use other strategies when you're really, really triggered right now. We need to pair these exercises with things that I do to calm down a little bit on purpose rather than things I do only when I'm losing my mind. So let the nervous system see that this is a safe thing to do. It's a good idea before you start using it as a resource to manage volcanic eruptions. <laughs> we, need, we, need, we need these to be flagged. We need these resources to be flagged as a good idea because by default, they're flagged as a terrible idea because they go against survival strategies. And then sometimes many of the training programs uh, give the trainees uh, the false impression that phase two is one session and yeah. phase two can be six months, eight months, a year. Right. Again, Clients. again, who other than you in the whole world understands the nervous systems of clients with complex trauma? Y'all do. You have sat with these clients before day one of your EMDR training, you sat with these clients for thousands of hours, right? You knew phase two was not going to be one session. So don't fall for the wand. The wand is the, the wand. EMDR is going to look like a magic wand for your healthiest clients. It is all day long. It's going to look like a wand for your healthiest clients. It's going to be magical. It's going to be amazing because of the enormous amount of adaptive information that they have, okay? If you have no adaptive information, if you have absolutely no adaptive information, do you know how much magic there is in EMDR therapy? There is zero. Straight out of the AIP model, there is absolutely zero. So what is our job as a therapist? Our job as a therapist is to start to create some help the client creating some, okay? We have here a question from KP. What language and things can you do to get that information to a client who fully believes that breathing does not work? Yeah. Psycho -ed? Absolutely, and do you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna not start with breathing, right? I'm gonna start, number one, how many clients do you think you've tried to teach breathing to while they were in a deeply ruminative state? They weren't even in the room. They were up, right? And then we're trying to teach breathe. No, no, no. Um, I usually start with grounding. And again, not this slow 12 minute, 18 minute, grounding exercise, you are dipping your clients in molten lead. Stop it. Your clients with the worst trauma, dip your toe. We do this, this exercise, you know, the, um, the sensory grounding that we do in 40 seconds, checking all of the senses. I've done this with thousands of therapists because it's part of the, part of the flash, you know, part, one of the resources in the flash training, it works, even though it's ultra ultra brief it simp it simply works for the for the vast majority of clients so um so once the client is able to see that we're approaching mindfulness differently using the resources other than the ones that they say don't eat. i had a client 
I had a client in um, early in my career that I met for the first time. I, we walked down the hallway and the moment she sat down, before I could even say my name, she pointed at me and she said, don't you even start to talk to me about that breathing shit. First thing she said is don't even start it. Right. And I'm like, I'm Tom. <laughs> it's, it's nice to meet you. And we're, I'm not going to talk to you about that breathing shit. So today, so I really good. Okay, we have another question. Often trainings discuss help to lower sympathetic arousal. Can you discuss what you do when client is hypo hypo aroused or in dorsal vagal in phase two? Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So what I'm looking for is I'm looking for something, right? Something that lets them feel something. A client may say, look, I hate people, but oh, my golden retriever, my golden retriever is my buddy. Okay. So, um, We'll try to get in touch with that. Or I don't like people, but I have a grandbaby and I kind of like that. So what we'll do is I'll teach them. And I think, you know, I think we have time. I invite you all, there's a, there's a, there's a body scan that I invite you all to do with me because it's central in getting people who are shut down, inviting awareness back into the body and inviting back awareness back into the present. So I invite you and check with your part, see if this is okay. We're going to do a body scan. It's a good model of this because you're going to use, I invite you to use your hands on your own body. We're going to do a body scan in less than a minute. Okay, good. So if you don't mind, copy me. And between your hands, how fast are your thoughts running? Zero to 10, zero is a desert, 10 is a jet engine. Give it a number, don't overthink it. Good, good. Now, Poke your jaw muscles. Do they feel soft and squishy like a pillow or tight like a steel cable? Pillow's a zero, steel cable's a 10. Give it a number, don't overthink it. Good. Neck muscles, same thing, zero to 10. Just notice. Good. Shoulder muscles, zero to 10, kind of poke them. Use information from your fingertips and from the muscles you're touching. Good. As you put a hand on the center of your chest, beneath your hand, do you feel a knot, pressure, tension, movement, heaviness, emptiness, or upset? If so, which of those? And how much? Give it a number, don't overthink it. Good, center of your body where your ribs kind of come together, knot, pressure, tension, movement, heaviness, emptiness, upset. Whatever it is, kind of identify it, give it a number, zero to 10. Good. And then your stomach. Okay. Zero to 10, not pressure, tension, movement, heaviness, emptiness, upset. Give it a number. Good. So when you do this with people that are really shut down, very often you get zeros below the jaw. Right. And these are people who are carrying a lot. Right. They, we would expect there would be some stress. Right. Then this is the territory. This is the territory where most of the noticing happens in EMDR. And if your client isn't in their body, if your client's really somatically dissociated, you're going to have a really hard time in the processing phases of EMDR because EMDR is a somatic psychotherapy. It's a bottom up psychotherapy. And if you don't have a bottom, there's really not much to do but noticing thoughts. And you know what emotions are if you're not in your body? They're just thoughts about feelings. Right. So clients will say, well, I think I would feel when you hear a client say, I think I would feel. Explore that almost guarantee you they're not in their body enough enough to notice. So, um, yes, someone someone inquired, not only can you do a phase two before you do a, a comprehensive phase one, I would say two things about this with clients who really pervasively traumatized nervous systems. Um you're going to have to do a phase two before you do any kind of comprehensive phase one. And to be honest, I'm not sure you need to do a phase one exactly the way we trained you because a phase one is about lining up. I mean, the way Shapiro does phase one, it's lining up a discrete number of targets and your clients have 55,000 memories, right? So what I'm doing in my initial take of phase one is to get a snapshot of the buckets 
that we're going to need, the buckets or the themes that we're going to need to work on. Everything, everything is in the, um, about uh, the, their scripts for all of these. There's also a script. And one of the things that I, one of my resources that's just been used probably by tens of therapists now, tens of thousands of therapists now, is my um, attachment figure resource. Okay. So what so many people, um, I'll put a link to the training because there's a free training that you can do that'll walk you through all of these. The scripts are in that training. Okay. Um, but there's a, this is a good example. The dip your toe in attachment figure is an example for when you go try to develop an attachment figure resource. And the client's like, I don't want, I don't want somebody to hug me. I don't want somebody to like come and try to be nice to me. So what we do is we develop the attachment resource for a kid that's not you. We develop the attachment resource for a kid in the neighborhood. And we ask, what would that kid like to eat? What would you think? What would that kid, how would that kid like an adult to spend time with them, right? And we can actually even tap this in for this kid who's not you. Do you see what we're doing here? We're having you try on something as though you're trying it on for somebody else. And then once it's, yeah. I, I had a client that um, it was so triggering for her that I started and I took this from what you do with um, uh, four blinks that mm -hmm. you use the videos, you outsource. So I, I used that and uh, I started with videos of animals doing nurturing things with their babies. Animals, you couldn't even think about another kid. That, yeah, that excellent for her and then after a while of doing with animals and these videos yeah. was able to imagine yeah. another kid and eventually good so again do you see how we have when a client doesn't have anything for the experience to link into we have to find an experience that they can link into to create the next step to create the next linkage to create the next linkage this is slow until you keep doing mindfulness the way you've been doing it. This is only slow until then. And then after this, you're going to have clients that are really, really moving through phase two. Once we can make slowing down, being present and noticing safe enough for them to be able to do it. So yeah, so the dip your toe in attachment figure, we try this stuff on using a kid that's not you to get around that unlovability exceptionalism that so many so many clients have. And then we, we just circle around and go, if we were to develop an attachment resource for you, which of those qualities that that kid was able to use might you be able to do today? And somebody may say, well, I don't want anybody to hug me, but if somebody wanted to make me cookies, that would be okay. And you see what we just did there? Right, we just we just created something, and now we're over here creating the next thing, and now we're over here creating the next thing. That's so much better than have people just jumping into the canyon of phase two endlessly. Good. Your approach reminds me of exposure therapy, says Dorit. Well, very I mean, I think of it more as trying to sense where the client's nervous system is and encourage them to have disconfirming experiences where their nervous system is um, rather than setting a kind of bar. I mean, so much, of, I mean, for so many people, phase two is almost like the ride at the county fair. It's like, this is the metric. For you to get on this ride, you need to be this high. And our clients are here. They keep showing up and they're here. And we keep sending them back to phase two. If you're sending the client back to phase two and endlessly doing the same thing over and over and over, phase two is going to be where any hope of ever doing EMDR reprocessing is going to go to die. So again, yes, working with clients was very, very, very difficult, clients with complex trauma. But we need to try to figure out the nuance of meeting their nervous system where it is and these dip your toe in resources. I'm gonna go ahead and put in, in chat, I'm gonna put the link to 
um, because lots of people are asking about the script. We'll put the link to the training. And when I post the recording, I'm going to um, post the scripts also. Yeah. Um, Yeah, all of the scripts are here. All of the scripts are in this training. And again, using what's in these scripts, the, uh, the ability to slow down the ability to to ask consent before you do anything. I mean, are you are you? It's a it's a good question to ask. Are you just guiding people through these resources? Or are you asking consent from their parts and having a conversation, having a dialogue with their parts before we just go against a survival strategy because it's in our scripts and that's what we're supposed to do now. So again, make it brief ask consent, and be incredibly, incredibly concrete about what you're asking the client to do and asking the client to notice. And I am not guaranteeing that any of these are going to work, right? Patricia just talked about an example where even the dip your toe in attachment figure resource, she had to go to another species first (laughs) in in order to see that it applies to humans and then ultimately to see that it might apply to me. So Mark Lee uh, says that this is all really helpful and asks if you can say more about how to continue to strengthen the links to adaptive resources as the EMDR treatment process continues. Yes. So a lot of what that is, so don't underestimate the ability for someone who has resources when they didn't have them before. Um, helping clients who've never had effective ways to regulate, to start having more effective ways to regulate, that's not enough. And I think, okay, a little a little bit more disclosure. So six years ago, seven years ago now, I went through something difficult, difficult divorce, it just, you know, gut, gut-wrenching difficult experience. I had a wide array of resources. And you know what? They didn't do it. They weren't, they weren't helpful enough. And if you've been through something horrible, you may have breathing, you may have dissociative call, you may have these things. They're not enough. But you know what I did? I did them anyway. And they helped me get through. Right. So we need to be able to normalize the idea that these resources help a little bit. They're not. These resources don't make someone a nine, a zero. The only resource that would make me a nine and make me a zero if I were a nine would be a rubber mallet across my head, right? So um, they don't have to, though. The ability to make a nine an eight, right, is the beginning of agency, right? The ability to stop a flashback with sensory grounding is the beginning of agency. And the beginning of agency may be the beginning of very important disconfirming information that we can start to link up subsequent stuff to. So if we recalibrate resources from, you're gonna do this thing and it's gonna just relax you and it's gonna, no, I mean, again, the way we talk about mindfulness, it's as though inside you, there's a garden. There's this beautiful, peaceful garden. Our clients with complex trauma What is inside them is Dresden after the war. It is the bombed out carnage of life. The inside isn't where you go to retreat. The inside is what, where their survival strategies are getting them away from because the insides where everything bad's happened. So um, when we're approaching this territory, we need to understand is, does this client have a garden inside them or do they have a bombed out a bombed out urban landscape inside them. And how you approach those two nervous systems has to be different. If not, you're putting everybody through a machine. Okay? You're put, and what if, this is my take, what if this is EMDR? What if that's EMDR? What if, what if all this, what if this is EMDR? What if this is mindfulness? What if all of this is mindfulness? Okay. This is big enough, right? This is big enough to contain more. 
So the other, just one last little, one last little thing. So many people that I consult with leave basic training with the impression that if I don't do EMDR, EMDR exactly right, if I don't do it exactly the way I'm trained, clients are going to have, I'm at, I'm at risk of hurting my client. What I say is, if you're putting people through a machine that does not match the actual shape of their nervous system, you are at risk of causing client harm. And you already knew that. Again, before your day one therapy, you, you were making accommodations for the nervous systems of the severely traumatized clients that you work with. So there's the, what I'm saying here, there's nothing here that I'm saying that's new or different or novel or anything. I'm just reminding you of what you already knew because you are the experts, believe it or not, even though we don't know what to do a lot of times, you are the experts in working with people with complex trauma. And then if, if EMDR isn't a magic wand, where is it? Doing EMDR well with clients with really complex trauma really does depend on understanding where the magic is and where the magic isn't in the MDR. And again, it's in the information. So if they don't have it, we have to help support it. We have to help grow it. One of the ways to grow it is by working on really small targets first, because every small target they clear is generating more adaptive information. Sometimes um, giving them very, very tiny, small experiences of success. And success could be something like doing the, that quick body scan and then taking one blue breath and then repeating the body scan. And if it went yeah. down one mm -hmm. point, then that's a success. Absolutely. And again, the, the, I, I didn't get back to the person, the question about someone who's really, really shut down. So the shut down will identify a resource that lets you feel okay. And then we're gonna do body scan, resource body scan. This body scan, you can do it in 10 seconds. So quick body scan, resource body scan, that's homework. Body scan, pet your dog, body scan. Body scan, pet your dog, body scan, without an agenda. I don't care if what you notice and that second body scan is different than the first one. It doesn't matter. The point is to check. These parts of the brain that get muted by trauma we can start to bring the body online for many clients slowly by bringing awareness, by checking. It's like going up to a canyon and going, hello, and we're just listening, right? The point is to just send the message through the brain and into the body and to listen to see if something comes back. And if nothing comes back, that's information. It's not failure. It's no failure. Client, when a client struggles in phase two, that's not failure, it's information. It's information. And I promise you, 100% of the time, the information that you see as a failure, that information is absolutely essential to the client's healing process. It's a success because they are uh, starting to listen to themselves and connect with themselves. They are observing. So that's yeah. a huge success already. Mm-hmm. So when clients struggle in phase two, it's not resistance. We're asking them to do your, I'm just asking you to take a few deep breaths. No, no, you're not. No, you're not. You're asking them to slow down when they know that their survival strategy depends upon staying ahead of it. This is a conversation that uh, <laughs> we'll have to, to have five hours for this, but we will have a chance when you do a, a full training for the community. Yes, excellent. Well, thank you so much, Thomas. Again, thank you for this conversation. Thank you for all the resources that you make available to everybody. You. you have so many websites and uh, <laughs> and things with uh, useful information that it's it's really a blessing. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming, everybody.